community schools because communities and schools is a very particular program, right? But the community schools framework is very much uh, been studied over the legislative session. There was a, a, um, a bill that was passed by Representative Rick Miera about five years ago. And I believe that there will be a proposal to fund uh, communities, community schools. Now, however, a district would implement that, but to fund it in the formula. <coughs> I just thought it was important for you to know that. As we look at anticipated sufficiency lawsuit funding, and I've, as you well know, I've been a part of a variety of groups um, that are working on this, and what seems to be consistent themes are increases in teacher pay, significant increases in teacher pay, additional days for professional development collaboration time so that kids get 182 days of instruction, pre-K, K3 plus, I've also heard K5 plus, and um, career technical education. The other two areas that have to be addressed um, in the lawsuit are poor children, English language learners, um, the Hispanic Education Act, and the Indian Education Act, because that was the main, one of the main areas of focus is that the state has, that the continued underachievement of children of color, poor children, English language learners, um, is the underfunding to meet their special needs to help give them a, a, an equitable opportunity to be successful. We also hope, can you go back, that uh, if you recall, our funding levels were still below 08 recession funding levels. To get us back to whole would be about $340 million. One of the things that's unique to the Santa Fe Public Schools that I think is pretty amazing that the district has managed to do this through the years, this is before me, I can't really take credit for it, and part of that has to do with the CBA, is that the legislature, when this happened and the funding crashed, they allowed districts to apply for, uh, they took away the class size limits. So there's some districts right now with 35 kids, 40 kids in a classroom. Santa Fe Public Schools has stayed at the lower levels um, because of the CBA, and then in some of our small, some of our small districts, thank you, in some of our small schools, like you know Asequia, et cetera, you can't make them larger. <laughs> and so, what will benefit us for having bit the bullet and figured out how to keep lower class size, even though we weren't funded, is that if they raise the class size back to what, or, or lower the class size back to statutory limits, we're already in compliance. So it's you know it's been and you know we've we've you know you all have made the choice to bite the bullet and to have lower class size, but I think it will be a benefit to us now. Um, but if you were to restore us to that level, and I say us, the state, uh, that would be 340 million. I believe that there might be a point of view that the 340 million could go to the sufficiency lawsuit and that you don't consider it as restoring us to whole. Does that make sense? The last thing I just want to say is that if you look at those funding recommendations, and if you remember when board member Trujillo was on our board, that she brought to you all copies of the NCSL No Time to Lose report. And if you look at the four major requirements of the No Time to Lose report that's coming from the National Council of State Legislators, the National Governors Association, uh, Senator uh, Mimi Stewart, who's the chair of the Senate Ed Committee, a real big champion, well, guess what's in it? Pre-K, early, early childhood education, that's covered in what's being recommended. Um, extended learning, which is being covered in K3, K5 plus. Um, more collaborative time and professional salaries for teachers, that's being covered in some of the recommendations that are coming from like groups and then an aligned system of education. And so, um, <coughs> It's hopeful that if people continue to, to have these commonalities of what these different advocacy groups and school districts and superintendents and school boards are saying, it is more likely that the legislature 
could come to consensus than if we're all you know in different directions and not agreeing to some of the first parts of of how this would address obviously the devil's in the details you know especially when you talk about indian education and hispanic education and what does that mean and one example of that is for example that the state would possibly fund um, teaching english as a second language and, and require that certification for all teachers in the state of New Mexico. Um, so it'll be fascinating to see how this plays out, but that gives you sort of a 30,000 foot view of what we think might happen. Okay, um, the, the next slide covers uh, HB 188 is, um, if you're familiar with the funding formula, it hasn't changed much in, in several years. And so if you've been dealing with the old funding formula for 18 years like, like I have, it, it, it's kind of exciting if, if that's even healthy to be excited about. But um, it is gonna change one of the factors in the funding formula that um, we always thought needed uh, a refresh. And that was a training and the experience index, which um, gives you more base, Basically, it gives you a, a, a multiplier for having teachers that have higher levels of experience or degrees, um, but it never addressed, it, addressed the tier levels, which is what really was costing us. So this new change will take that into consideration, uh, replace the years of experience, which they've uh, found really didn't have any correlation to student achievement. And so um, they are gonna phase this in. It's not gonna be immediate. There's a lot of different changes from where it's going to be located in the funding formula. They're going to move it up. They're, they're, they're not going to include as many um, job classes. It's going to be strictly teachers. Uh, the old training experience index factored in several other job classes. Uh, they're going to have a phase in for both the um, well, they're going to have a hold harmless period, which is phased in as well. So if, if a district is going to be um, impacted severely with these changes, they'll, they'll be held harmless somewhat from having a too large of a financial hit. The also, they're also going to slowly work in this index. Um, first year, the, um, the new index is only going to make up 25% of the factor with the old one being 75, and then it goes to 50-50, and then 25-75 until it eventually just replaces it altogether. So it, it, it's going to be exciting to see what the changes are. It's something that we, um, we thought was, was due. Uh, it finally addresses the tier, um, which we had no real control over, but it, it'll hopefully cover that. We'll see. Uh, there will be more guidance in October because it, it is a pretty big initiative. So we'll um, we'll share that as it comes out. Good evening. Um, the final slide um, of the presentation is in regards to the capital outlay um, update. We do have 12 appropriations in progress, um, and we prioritize those based on um, the project reversion dates. Um, we worked very closely with Robert Martinez, our capital accountant, um, to ensure that we're following all the steps of the process. Um, there is one grant that we have not been able to initiate as originally titled. Um, and this is one of the challenges of capital outlay. Um, we had um, received a grant for the door barricade system in El Dorado, and that's a time sensitive project. Well, that particular award wasn't in the cycle um, for the bonds to be cashed in this season. And the process is such that we wouldn't be able to get the funds prior to the project. And so we proceeded with the project knowing that we can use that alternative process of going back to um, our representative who sponsored that and asking for a project in the same category of security, but of a different um, detail so that they can still sponsor a project at that school. But we didn't want El Dorado waiting out a whole school year, a whole season for that. And was there a handout that you guys had? Sure. And maybe you might just talk them through that quickly, Christy or Richard. So um, one of the things that I think we've talked about in the, in the past is that um, there's challenges with capital outlay in the multiple steps necessary um, to execute a project. And it's um, particularly um, 
difficult in a school district where oftentimes your window of opportunity is limited to summers. Um, but we've worked closely with business services to outline all the steps and track where everything is at. Um, and so that's what I was mentioning mentioning earlier that um, we're obviously um, most focused on things with a reversion date of June um, of 2019 because our window of opportunity to get through all these steps um, is much smaller than some with a date further out. Um, you also would want to note, um, I believe, that a couple of these projects um, are being executed by our partner entities. For example, um, the Connie Elementary Early Learning Center um, is doing a major playground improvement, and um, Robert Martinez has been working closely with them to help them through the process um, of getting bids and submitting the appropriate paperwork um, to actually secure the funding so they can um, execute that project. I think they were a little surprised when they came to us in May that they wouldn't be able to get through this process in time to open with a new playground in August. Um, but they've been really great working with them. And then Head Start is also um, noted on here some improvements um, to, I think, their Busy Bees um, campus. Would you also introduce Robert? Have we introduced you before to the board? You can come sit over here. Yeah, I'd like to introduce, do you want to introduce him, Richard? Yeah. Uh, this is Robert Martinez, who started with us uh, in February and immediately dove into the um, special capital outlay, learned the whole process, met with BD staff several times to um, get a good understanding of, of the process and also to, um, to get a good determination of where we were at with our projects. So. And Robert comes to us yep. from? Uh, several stops, right? The county was the best. Um, you have to uh, use your mic. And yeah. <clears throat> I was at the county um, with corrections. Um, and then I was also at the New Mexico State Penitentiary. Terrific. So since Christy, you're sitting up, I have a series of questions about the presentation, but since you're here right, here right this second, on Adelaia, um, so is that to resurface the basketball court, or is it just lighting for the basketball court? Because when I was out there, it was a very coarse surface. Um. It, the basketball court is a small portion of a large master plan for the playground. Um, and I think that the improvements um, may include even some areas of the perimeter. Um, but after the Adelia construction project, um, the playground wasn't something that we renovated. And so we used the strategy to expand our capabilities. But I, I don't have the plans in front of me. If I recall correctly, it was surfacing, um, hoops, fencing, et cetera. But the parent group um, actually sponsored a master plan for the campus that includes walking trails, hard and soft surfaces, et cetera. And so there might be some ground cover included in there as well. Cool. Would that be turf for the little soccer area and nets for the soccer goals? Um, I was there serving food in the cafeteria and I looked around and I said, this looks just like when we built it four years ago. And, um, you know, if you're playing soccer, you need a little net to catch the ball. And just think, you know, simple things. So our, um, the master plan that the parent group sponsored um, includes a turf field, but turf fields aren't a standard for our elementary schools. Um, they're pretty cost prohibitive. Um, most of our regulation fields are in excess of a million dollars, as you yeah. know. Um, but even small fields are in, um, you know, the eight hundred thousand to million dollar range. Um, but something like soccer goals is something that um, schools can access even just through equipment money at the district level through our mill levy funds. Just curious, because like when I've gone to Salazar, um, they have like a little bitty field. Like what would that? It's not. I mean, I'm sure it's still a half, that's the half a million. I mean, that's. Turf is so crazy expensive, right? So, um, you know, the complication with artificial turf fields is not necessarily the grass finish. It's all the engineering and dirt work under the field. So that's the complexity, Got it. architectural fees, et cetera. And Salazar Green was a project sponsored with it through a community partnership. And I can't speak to the exact funding source, but it wasn't entirely funded by Santa Fe Public Schools. It was meant to be a community partnership project. Um, and that happened just slightly before my tenure, you know, somewhere in the oh. last nine, nine to 10 year range. Um, but it was over a million dollar project, believe it or not. 
And so that is why, um, though some turf field sort of, I would say, snuck on to our elementary school campuses, it's not a part of our playground standards for elementary school. And that is fairly disappointing to our um, campuses because kids like to go outdoors and run around and play and we don't really provide that kind of surfacing um, in our elementary schools. The K-8s all have fields with the exception of Gonzales. Maybe that's something the um, CRC can address at some point in the next four years. So Rudy, um, it's on, I imagine it's on Capital Outlay, Marine too. So we'll just, because of that, we'll do Capital Outlay questions now with Christy here, and then we'll go to questions on the uh, presentation. Is that okay with the group? Great. Rudy, then Marie. Just really quick, I <clears throat> never realized his name was Robert Martinez. I always thought his name was Little Bobby. <laughs> I've, known, I've known Mr. Martinez since he was four years old, four or five years old. And he actually has extreme knowledge in uh, capital outlay procurement that he did a lot for the county. So welcome, Robert Martinez. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maureen? So just wait, just oh. in regards to Adelaide, if you actually read this, what it says, if you go to Adelaide, it says, so this, this $75,000 can be to plan, you could hire a planner, to design, you could hire an architect to design it, and construct improvements. So improvements could be a walking track, a brick, any bricks and mortar for that. So that's how you read this, is to plan, and or design, and or construct, and or purchase, and or install. So that's so that whenever you ask whether that money can be utilized for different types of whether it's equipment, construction, design, drawings, that's how you actually read the, the legislative language. No, no, I see, I see that. I was just curious yeah, as whether or not uh, turf was included in that. Uh, I know it's actually I know turf is not included in that because of that incredibly low price. My concern initially was the basketball court because right now it's such a coarse surface. And I remember that old basketball court there was that smooth concrete. And so when a kid falls on the coarse one, they're guaranteed not just a raspberry, but a really good bloody injury. So look, I'll keep reading there. So it includes the purchase and installation of equipment, includes lighting to the playground and basketball court. So they either be so really quick, just on that particular one. So if this, if the parent PTA the parents have actually have some sort of a rough master plan that they've drawn out, can does the school district actually utilize their the parents' master plan that they drew up, or do we? We have had worked with them to develop this master plan because um, the basketball courts weren't necessarily their number one priority, but it was what was funded. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that they had a long-term vision for the campus. And um, in addition to, um, you know, completion of this project, any improvement that we do to the campus would based on, be based on the master plan as our mill levy funds or other funding allows. So really quick, Christy, these, all these projects that expire in uh, June of 19, are we going to finish these projects? Um, we are working very quickly um, to make sure that these projects are executed and we can capitalize on these funds um, to meet the deadline. That's why they're our priority right now. Because, for an example, if you look at, you know, the first project, which is Santa Fe PSD Early Learning Center, that was a grant that was given to us in 14. The next one was a grant given to us in 14. So we've had that grant, and I know this is pre you. We've had that grant for several years. So I would just hope that we don't, any of these dollars do not get reverted back to the general fund for Department of Finance, local government. One of the, one of the ones I have here is um, probably halfway down to the page is actually Sweeney, Ele Sweeney Elementary. That's to plan, design, construct, purchase, and install fencing. That's $25,000. Probably can't buy us a lot of fencing. However, they're at the southeast corner of that school near the major intersection there. The fence needs a lot of work there. And there's actually some homeless individuals that are south of that property that actually reside or they did reside last year down there. So those are just, I just don't want, I want to make sure that we don't use, lose any of this, any of this funding. Also in regards to the Santa Fe Presbyterian, Presbyterian Head Start, is that our money to oversee or is that their money? Or are we a fiscal agent for that? But why? So the Presbyterian Head Start and the United Way are on our properties, and that's how we become right. um, their fiscal agent. But the, prop, the project management, though we refer them to contractors and approved vendors, is them. And then um, Robert or his predecessors have worked directly with their agency to go through all these steps across the top of the spreadsheet. And also, do, I don't know, because it's on state price agreement, does the schools, Robert knows state price agreement very, very well. So does... Um, 
when we're a state price when there's state price agreement can the schools actually use state price agreement so you you have a fencing company that already did price agreement for so many linear feet for a chain link fence at installation of whatever hundred dollars every five feet so do we do you know if we can actually utilize state price agreement there are some um, and those are referenced on every single quote before they go through procurement okay um, so Christy, the, the appropriate appropriations and progress these are all the only appropriations we have from the last four or five years of capital alley monies for the district from the legislative process do you know do we know um, would you repeat the questions so these are these the only appropriations we have from the state legislature yes thank you So I just want to clarify, you kept on, and we'll use the Adelaide project, you kept on saying the parent group, the parent group. Did the parent group go to the legislature? Or so that was something that we as a district brought to the, I just want to make sure we clarify who's going to our legislatures for projects on our property. So typically um, projects are identified through a combination of the superintendent, um, facilities and maintenance. Sometimes the board will um, present a project or a school for which they wish to have a project or our lobbyists will identify um, an elected official who's looking for something, a project to sponsor. Um, in this case, it was end of Adelaide construction. We'd spent $14 million on the campus. We weren't going to improve their playground. And so we put that in as one of the projects. Um, but the parent group, um, the PTA, um, didn't feel that the basketball courts were their number one priority for their kids. We'd already submitted for this direct appropriation and been funded for it. So we wanted to make sure that the basketball court, which is a typical function of a playground um, and is a good thing to fund, would be incorporated into the master plan for the campus. So their sponsorship was really of the master plan. And our sponsorship and recommendation was for this sort of core function of a court. You know, it's like having equipment. It's something we just have on playgrounds. Um, so it was a collaborative process, and their hope was eventually to fundraise for some of their really pie-in-the-sky features that maybe aren't a part of a typical playground. And our function was to provide the basics, like other playgrounds across the district. The reason I asked that question, I just wanted clarification so we don't have our schools thinking, well, all of our parent groups should be going to their individual legislators, and then we've lost control of the process, and we don't know. The, the other question I have, and I know we've talked with them, and I think there was going to be a discussion, how do we speed up this process on special capital outlay, because when we go to the legislate, you know, they, they want those projects so they can show them, this is what I did for you because you elected me. And if it's a couple of years out, you know, they're not able to say that. So how, how do we, have we had a conversation with the legislature? I mean, I'm sure every school district is facing, every, every capital outlay project is facing that. Well, um, you, you touched on one of the biggest takeaways I, I was hoping would come out of this, and that is, you know, when we are sitting down with our legislatures, you know, the, the, the intentions are there. There's a hot topic issue, security or whatnot. Um, but it, it just sometimes those are the ones that need to respond quicker than others. It's, it's immediate need or, or is, is appears to be one. And um, we just, um, it, it's difficult because you don't want to, turn them off from helping us, but uh, just as long as they understand all the, the, the hurdles that have to happen and that there's, it's practically impossible to get something um, implemented within three, four months of, of uh, appropriation, just everything that it requires. And, and so, um, you know, maybe, maybe we could, um, if we say we'll, we'll, we'll do that with our own funds, but if you could fund this other one that may take, you know, further down the road perhaps or um, that might not be as appealing for them to carry, unfortunately. So there is a balance there. And, and just my last question on <clears throat> special capital outlay. Um, 
obviously the legislature's <clears throat> session is coming up. Have we decided what our capital outlay projects? I mean, our legislature has been pretty good in funding us, but I, uh, well, I know, not for last year, but we understand why that happened. Um, but they have been, our, our delegation has been very supportive of Santa Fe Public Schools. So can we get together and figure out what our projects are? And just a reminder, I do have a representative that will, will not fund for all the school district because he only has one school that belongs to here, Representative McQueen. But he's going to be looking, you know, for a project to sponsor. So, so can we get on top of that we, right now? We are, but I think we scheduled, and I can't remember, Miss Sink or somebody can help me. We talked about it at Cabinet, and you and I were going to try to get together on the future meeting dates and what we want on them. But I want to say the next meeting in October, was it October 2nd where we were going to see if they wanted to discuss legislative priorities? Or Ruth, do you have the notes? Yes. So I thought we would have the discussion with you all prior to a legislative breakfast that will be earlier than later, um, probably later in October. But I thought we could have that discussion then to see what your interests are. Um, and then we have some recommendations. In terms of actually identified capital projects, I think you know, I do, do want to check with Mario to see if there's any security updates that we might need. But um, Ms. Wagner, do you have anything? At this point, that just off the top of your head, or you, we really, you really need to work with Gabe and I don't, and I, I think that I would recommend that if we do something that it's not time sensitive, that it's something um, maybe at a district level, with the exception of individuals who only sponsor one school, um, because the amount of sort of minutia, you know, the, the the work involved with these small appropriations, though appreciated, are it is really cumbersome and um, complicated and so if we can really concentrate our efforts um, and just maybe do a couple of things um, it would make it I think a more effective process for us Ms. 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 What? on that note <coughs> me and then you could so what, one of the things you said Maureen which actually <clears throat> I would tend to disagree with I want our PTCs and PT, uh, uh, PTAs to go to their legislatures if there's something that they want because they're their constituents as well. So whether it's at Aldo or you know whether it's at EJ or whatever it is, I mean I would want them to go to their legislators because that's the legislator's role. And then also the legislator would come to us and say, look, um, you know these folks at uh, EJ Martinez have asked for this. One, do you do you need it? Um, Two, does the does the site support it, or how feasible is it? Because what they w might want, and what we know the site and uh, programmatic uh, plans can support, can be two different things. But I want them to. Use, that's the whole idea of having a legislator. I, I guess I take a different approach, and that's <clears throat> how I approached it with the tennis courts when we got that money. We. We went and we asked the legislatures and how we got all of those, all of, they all chipped in, except for one legislator, but they all chipped in because after we identified the project, then I went out and I asked everybody in that community to please write, contact, call your legislature. <coughs> and then they said, oh yeah, we're getting, you know, I mean, because I even, even my daughters who wrote to their individual had got letters back from them saying, I'd love to do it count me in. And well, it so goes both ways, so it's yeah, perfect so, what you're saying. But, that's but how I, the, I, yeah, yeah. But I don't want, I don't want <clears> us <throat> to go in a legislature think, this is a great project, and we're thinking, oh, well, wait a minute, we already have this scheduled, and the little bit of money you're giving us, the project is, you know, a $3 million project, and giving us, you know, I mean, we like all the money, but we're not, we know we're not getting three months. Well, they're going to come to us. We're custodians of the property. There's no way they're going to grant $300,000 for something without coming to us and saying, so-and-so has asked for this. What do you think? Rudy. So I would like to see the school district actually create some sort of a plan for what our priorities are. And whether you actually break up the state representative, state senator's district to SUNY Elementary School, who are the two reps there, or the state senators, we can ask them for whatever we need there, $50,000, $75,000 for a fence, for a playground equipment, or whatever is outdated in that, okay, in that area. Because if not, if we don't have some sort of plan, I'll tell you that I'm going to go myself to the state legislature and ask my state representatives in my school districts and ask for money for whether there's fencing, playground equipment, whatnot. But it'd be great if we can all 
go to, if you're state legislature, you want the public schools or the city or the county to say, what are your priorities? What do you want? You know, the county goes and asks for $2 million for a building. They, we're not going to give you $2 million, but we can actually utilize smaller playground equipments from our state legislators because if not, the public's going to go and do it. Right. So, so October 9th. But um, our study session is on October 9th to discuss capital outlay for all the different sites. So I would say that if you want to, prior to then, it's a good time to reach out to your PTC presidents and see is there something that they've been discussing that we, you know, representing our, our districts can bring to the, uh, to the study session. Additional questions on capital outlay for Christy? Ms. Noble? Can you say a little bit more about step three? Um, receive doc from FNM to prepare our TOF. And just what happens in step three, where? So um, step three um, would be a detailed quote from an approved <coughs> vendor or procurement, um, the approved proc procurement methodology um, to identify the equipment, the contractors, et cetera. And so um, after the initial notice um, to the state that we, um, you know, would like to execute this, um, this award, um, we have to provide a detail of the project. And then step four, you're going into the request to obligate funds. And so that's why that detail level is required. And that's what um, Board Secretary Garcia was asking about. Um, procurement options and whatnot at that stage. Yep. So by the end of step three, you've satisfied procurement, basically, and you've selected a vendor. Yes, that's okay. correct. So that's a very big step, which is part of the reason it appears to be one of the um, pinch points. Correct. <laughs> okay. Um, and can you say a little bit more about the first, um, the PSD Early Learning Center, prepare the site for and to plan, design, and construct? the Early Learning Center at Agua Fria Elementary School. Um, the allocation, is this a multi-year allocation? What was this specifically for? It's a strange amount. Um, so one of the issues with some of these projects, um, you know, Board Secretary Garcia mentioned we've had some of these appropriations for a while. Well, there was a lot of moving parts and pieces. We were re redesigning the Agua Fria campus initially to build there. And then we moved the campus. Mm -hmm. um, and then the United Way was going to be a partner on the old Agua Fria campus. Um, but we ended up staying there as a nigh self contained facility. Um, and the shorter and the, the short answer is um, we had to regroup around what our priorities were as programs and schools and partners move different places. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we have to identify for ourselves what the priority was to get through these hoops um, and that's part of the process that we're in right now okay so and that's what it was intended for initially has evolved okay. because programs and players changed and that's the same with the nye early childhood center um, playground imp i'm sorry the connie elementary early learning center to give you an idea the original appropriation was to build a kitchen on the agua fria campus mm -hmm. Like, so time has really evolved on these projects because there was so much movement. And on that early learning center one, because the description of what is to be done is way more than the less than $20,000. What I mean, to, to prepare the site for plan, design, and construct an early learning center is not going to cost $20,000. So uh, an additional clarification of that, um, Board Member Noble, is that when, just because we identify a project, um, I, you know, we put in for the fields at Capitol High School one year, that project is going to be upwards of $3 million. <laughs> we were just throwing it out there to see if maybe multiple people want to sponsor it. Well, we might get 50000 mm -hmm dollars and so then we have to decide what direction we're going to go with that and that's part of the regrouping process like are we just paying someone to design and engineer something are we buying a piece of equipment are we having to re-identify what we're doing because it's just not enough and that's part of the questionnaire is you have to answer whether or not there'll be district funds to supplement the project and sometimes there's not enough over time um, you and know, to get to the whole scope, and so you have to regroup. 
And there are in the steps um, abilities to regroup and, and redirect funds. And I, I would guess that's why around like the Early Learning Center, again, as an example, it's a somewhat generic and encompassing description for a f relatively small appropriation. So that's what was appropriated but the whole project and, and as you say with all the moving parts you end up figuring out how to plug it in. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Crippler. So really quick what we could do is we could actually reauthorize all these projects to the schools of my district and that would actually help out one big project, right? <laughs> yes. So here's a here's 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 a, here's a no, no, no. So, 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 let's, let's, so, I guess one of the things I'm bringing up is a couple things. Is, is we we had a lot lot larger list than this, and we have closed out some of those projects. So, have we actually checked with the local PED and have we responded to them that we are at closeout and submitted all the documents to them that this project is closed out because this this list was a lot lot larger. Yes. So there are no, I mean, available funds. Like if there was like a dollar left over, it's been closed out. Um, like Richard had said earlier, I work very closely with PED. So, I mean, I have to update CPMS monthly and make sure there's no balances where they're at. You know, th also, as I was talking to Christy, the scopes are very broad, you know, so, and, and that's nice because yes. sometimes the needs change. And, and that way, you know, if a need does change or, you know, if maybe 19,984 won't do a project, but just say $25,000 will, and we can come up with that additional funding, you know, we'll be able to actually meet what our need is at the time compared to what our need was in 2014 or 15. So that's what's nice about the projects being so broad, the scopes being so broad. We can um, redirect them. Uh, that's something that has to be done through PED, um, and we have done that. So that's also another option. Um, so maybe at the next, at the October meeting, staff can come forward for, to the board here and ask us or let us know what appropriations you feel that need to be reauthorized because that's no longer needed. It's no longer in use. There's not enough funding. If you could help us out with that. So one that comes to mind, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, Secretary Garcia, it's obviously the El Dorado project, right? Yes. And, and then, of course, as a courtesy, we would talk to the representative McQueen and, and explain why and see if there's another project that is needed at El Dorado. But um, the staff will go through and analyze those and then um, see what is needed and then, of course, communicate to those legislators if that's what you all would like us to do. Well, if, she can, if, you, if staff can bring back the list to us before we go talk to them. Thank you. This is a good example is plan design, construct, improve, and equip practice fields at Capitol High School. $35,000 may not buy us much, but it, that definitely can buy us a backstop. I'm just throwing that out there. And if I may add on that one, there has been some work already done to that one. That's why you'll see the allocation amount and the project balance are a little bit different. So there has been some work done, an RFR submitted, funds received. So. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to move on now. Uh, Maureen had a question earlier, so I'm going to go me, Maureen. Should I just go down the line, Rudy? And Kate, is that okay? Okay. Is this still on Capitol Alley? No, but but if you're going to go down the line and you're well, I'm going to. We're starting to come. Where's I know that you had a question on slide whatever it was yeah, thirty. Yeah, no, but I, I'm just saying is if you're asking a question on slide number one and one of us also has another question, then of course, slide, then let's ask them all on that. Okay, everybody on slide number two. <laughs> yes, no, I think that's a Maria. That's a great suggestion. Um, so we're going to have to keep going back and forth. Um, so I just have on slide number two, if, uh, if the Jaramillo group is going to be completing their November 5th, um, their audit by November 15, are we going to get, I know it's going to go to the audit committee, but then are we going to get a report, a brief report, not a 20 minute report, but a brief report from Audrey and the gang? Absolutely, Mr. President, great. it's a pleasure. Okay, no, that'd be great. On slide three, what I ha have is, um, and this was a, let's see, review of interface. Kate, what's the term? Uh, you and I discussed this once where it's um, not an ombudsman with the city, but like the person, I'm sorry? Liaison? Not a liaison, but the person that does, oh, in, like compliance, compliant officer. So um, slide number three, it just, 
this, this, this came to mind, and Kate and I discussed it, I don't know, like maybe a year ago, when this whole TD thing came up, and whether or not it might behoove us at some point to either contract out or have internally, um, but I would want the money to be, I would want it to be cost neutral, where they were doing something that somebody else was doing, to have uh, and a compliance officer that wasn't beholden to the district that could, uh, you know, there's a lot in education. I think it's probably, of all the different agencies, probably one of the toughest. Um, so yes, Dr. Garcia. So, uh, you know, I, I have, a, I, I don't mind that, and if that's what the board would like, of course we would, you know, we would figure out how to make that happen. Um, and I wish that Ms. Noble were back. I think we're in desperate need of an internal auditor. <laughs> We are in desperate. Are they the same? Am I using no. the terms wrong? They're, no. They're two, well, no, they're not the same. They're, they're two different things. A compliance officer, and if we could afford it, I would love to have a compliance officer that would look at Title IX, special ed, you know, all of those things that you're making sure that you're in federal compliance, you know. Um, every district that I've worked in has had a compliance officer, which is more program, and an internal auditor, and the internal auditor uh, you know, can go out to the schools uh, because I think we're very vulnerable when it comes to student activities, uh, any number of things, right, that, that the board might have an issue. And they do have a degree of independence and report to me and to the board because here's the deal, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened that there's no way a superintendent really knows or the board knows. You're pretty much sometimes at the mercy of what's being brought to you. Now, I get in there and I dig, but like for example that one policy that you were you know concerned about you take it uh, even you're hiring staff to bring you policies and you trust you're not going to research every policy and, and that's where I think uh, either a compliance officer and an internal auditor would be of great value um, moving forward and I think as we build budget next year I would like to see us do that um, I, I think both functions are really needed. I said a compliance officer and an internal auditor. Now, can one person, I mean, we're only a district of, then it's going to be 1,300 kids. Can one person do both functions? Uh, yeah, I think they could. I, th you know, I think that they just have to kind of pick and choose where they're going to spot, check, and test. But yes, I th well, there are two different skill sets. Usually a compliance officer understands federal law, OCR, Title IX, um, IDEA. They're, they have, they're more like paralegals or they have that sort of a background. And, um, and, then, and I think that our general counsel does some of that, right? I think that she helps us a lot with a compliance piece. So maybe some of that function is being taken over by the, by the general counsel, although we keep her super busy. But once we get caught up, I think, on getting the policies all aligned, I think that the general counsel could take on more compliance and perhaps we look at an internal audit function. She giving me a yes or a no? <laughs> but, um, but I do agree with you that I think it's greatly needed and I think we should look at seeing a bit. I've been asking for that for a couple of years, but we didn't have the budget to add it. Well, if that could be something that um, we take notes on to bring up in December when we have an next finance committee. That'd be great. So, does anyone else have anything on slide uh, three? Yes. So the last, the last bullet on slide three says awaiting final report. Do we know how soon that's going to come from Michael B? Very soon. Very soon. So as soon as I get it, review it. We'll. So I might have him come and, and give a presentation, or we can tie it into one of the study sessions. So by the end of October. Oh, I, yeah. I'm fairly certain that yes. Okay. Slide three? Okay. Um, slide four. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Noble. Just a couple comments on that, which is uh, I am, um, I would hope to understand, uh, I, I think that an internal auditor is sometimes a term that is loosely thrown around. I take seriously, Dr. Garcia, when you say that you want that. Um, in my view, it is something that needs to be carefully weighed upon the benefits of bringing in an outside firm who um, can look at things with clean eyes, you hire expertise for best practices. There is a lot that can go wrong with an internal audit function. And um, I, 
I mean, my husband works for Los Alamos National Labs with very sensitive materials, and um, sometimes it seems as if the uh, functions like that almost serve to perpetuate their own need by finding things and slowing things down. And hence, um, sometimes an outside firm where there's a clarity of purpose, best practices, expertise might be a better road. road. Precisely, rather than an ongoing sort of make sure you keep the wheel spinning role, something that makes sure that the systems are speaking to each other. I'm pleased to see that you are doing that on this slide. But anyway, I just I just want to voice that I think it, it needs to be carefully weighed because these things often sound good, but in functionality, and it was something that, you know, we can look to the city of Santa Fe and what happened with internal auditing there. Um, and, and and honestly, there's cautionary tales. So I think ultimately, it's the function that I think we greatly need. And uh, I think after we look at this report, I mean, we can also look at where we are in contract services. And you know, there's other areas that we're identify identifying or that we need to go deeper into. Um, and I also believe that um, Ms. Sullivan has been reviewing our policies, I think, in light of some of those issues that came up just to make sure that we're in compliance with um, state statute and um, changing regulations. I mean, she's, we're updating, and we'll be seeing more policies come to you with cleanup language. Uh, just on that, I would agree with Kate, the idea of, that sometimes internal can just perpetuate what's happening, and I would, I would support um, somebody from the outside, fresh eyes, everything you just said. So I don't know how, when it comes to us, um, I would say there's two people that clearly want fresh eyes from the outside. Rudy, did you going to push on your little? Okay, then I'm going to go to slide four. Is that cool? Yes. So my only question about ETN is, I don't know to what extent the state charters are aware of what's going on with the change in election law. So have we been keeping them abreast of the possible gap they may face and how they have to play in and everything the else? The state charters? Well, yeah, I mean, the ones that Monte, you know, because, because we typically, you know, they're under the PED, and the PED should be communicating to them. Exactly. So, no, we have not. Um, we are responsible for communicating with ours, and have we let um, ATC, uh, are they aware? Superintendent Garcia, no, we haven't really had any discussions other than so what the should. immediate. I would just, you know, get in touch with Ms. Longley and. Yeah. Just let them know what's coming down the pike and what they might be in store for if we're not able to. I mean, I don't think we'll have a gap because I have a feeling this board may just choose to do ours in February, so there is no gap, our mail. But uh, anything else on slide four, Ms. Noble, and then Mr. Garcia. I just love a, a brief explanation of why um, I assume our ETN funds these schools, and I, I don't understand the basis of bullet point one. Um, just also on that note, the question I had on bullet point one is, is, is what, since Turquoise Trail is a state charter school, why is it included in, the board, in this bullet point as well? Just really quick. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's required in statute, They right? get ETN money. Yeah, I, I, I think if, they're, if they fall within the, the, the county collection area, since it's based on, um, yeah, that, that they, they get a certain percent of, you know, based on what their, their counts are. Similar to so HB. these, once again, yes. these are all state charter schools, right except for ATC. That's correct, yes. So how come ATC is on this bullet point? Just really quick. Uh, well, I think ATC falls in that same category with their, their, their in parents. In the county. Yeah, their, it's, it's basically more of who falls within the footprint of the county than what their, their soup, um, affiliation, uh, yeah, chartering authority is. Chartering authority. Yeah. Was your question answer, uh, answered, Ms. Noble? I think so. The portion is then based, it's based on student counts. So what is given to whatever is raised is somehow divided according to student counts. And there is a portion allocated to any charter school, district, or state within the geographic area is how it works. Yes. OK. Correct. Thank you. There's a lot in that bullet. I also understand that our charter schools um, part of they've been part of the voting campaign uh, regarding ETN. Great. Um, on slide, does somebody have anything on slide five? Yes. Uh, Mr. Garcia. 
Once again, just really quick, please. The ATN generates 9.6 million annual, annually. And is that, how long is that for? Five, seven, ten year duration? And is that, uh, how, how long is that? Like and on that, is that 9.6 for us? Because it's 11 million total on the note, Neil, right? Is that Correct. for four years? Okay. That's, that's our portion. Five years. So 9.6 9. is our portion for a five year period until you go back out to get another yeah. bond. Yes, no? Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anything else on five? Nope. Okay, on six, I have. Uh, just really quick, I apologize. Are you on five? I, yes. Did I hear you say earlier, Superintendent, that the county clerk's office has been non-responsive to any questions we have? Well, it, it's I, I think that when we've called, it's not that they're not responsive, but it's like we'll get back to you tomorrow, or the secretary's not sure. It's not that they're not cooperating, and we just haven't been able to get an answer. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So on six, um, uh, we have. Let's see, second meeting in October. So I would say that by the second meeting of October, which will be October 16, we should decide by then, maybe what we'll do is have it for discussion on the second and weigh pros and cons um, in terms of having the mail ballot. And then on the 16th, we can make a decision as a group as to the, if that's the direction we're gonna go. What does the group think about? Not anything else on page six, but just that right now. Uh, I, I, I think we need to weigh pros and cons because I'm not sure I'm ready to say yeah. Right, so we'll do that on the second. Okay. The second we'll have it as a presentation and discussion. Okay. And it'll say possible action, but we'll deter we'll take action on the 16th. Does that, because there are, we have plenty of time if you have in, need to have individual meetings with um, Dr. Garcia, there's plenty of time to do so. Does that sound reasonable? I, I guess one of the things things that I would need to know as a board member on on pros and cons I'm concerned if we go out and have a special election in February how do we ever get back on the normal schedule or, or are we always going out for a special election so we need to so we're probably committing to that is what you're are we yeah, committing yeah, to it, it every February probably yes. do that I for mean, ATN I though but not for the others though right? the others because there's a gap if we will be on cycle and it won't be a problem for us, but right where I was looking at. Jeff, so ETN is only that. every. Um, it's the ETN one, but I do think that you would be off cycle. I mean, it just stands to reason that you would continue to be. Well, I guess if we were going to be off cycle, what we need to try to do is we don't want to be paying for all these special elections. So somehow, and I guess we need to try to figure out the legality of it, if the. You know, and I understand the November tax bill situation and all of that, but is there a way that we could go out while we're still spending ETN money and go out to the voters and, and go out a year early to get, you know, to get us back on cycle? You know, I don't know if we can. We can. I don't know what she's saying. That, but do you understand what I understand you're what you're saying. saying. If we could have that and presented to us, we don't need the answer yeah, so now. Okay. No, so no, hold no, on a second, no, everybody. That's a different Here's the deal. We're going to discuss all this on October 7th. Yes, thank you. But let's just have this as part of that discussion, because what I hear you saying is once November rolls around, maybe we have a vote for that we would normally do in February, do it in November, but the public understands that these funds are not going to be released until the, but all that's going to be presented to us on the second. And just real quick on that, we have to strategize. It might just be a case by case, an election by election basis. We're not, we're not competing for the next four or five, 10 years out that we're going to do this special election every single year. So let's well, yeah, we'll, we'll get that on the second. Yes. Okay, great. Anything else on ETN, Maureen? And the other thing I have on slide number six. Six, thank you. Is it says possible one time legislative fix to mitigate costs. When are we going to know that? So we need to know that when we talk next week. You won't or, know. Or we won't, you, you know, and we go. You won't on. know. Okay. You won't know. The only or, thing that would happen is you would get reimbursed if you decide. But we have to make sure that they have language that will reimburse any of the districts that took it upon themselves to do so. But we can discuss that on the second as well. Yes, because That's a really good point. We want our money back. But there will be no guarantee. Just because you have, exactly, just because you have legislators that are actually out of the Albuquerque area saying yes, the state budget is actually going to assist the APS in funding their special election. So depending on how that bill goes, whether it's just structured for APS or does like, all the entire, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anything else on slide 60, 10, Snowball? I have one thing. Oh, 
On site six? Yes. So in regards to the additional cost of $180,000, and, and we've actually have already budgeted the annual cost of $67,000, so that leaves $113,000 $113, that we would need to find. Correct. Thank you. Ms. Noble. So on October 2nd, is it possible that we can look at all of the things we need to send to the voters until we're on a cycle, HB, SB? And I think all of those, as I recall, there, there isn't a problem, right, Jeff, as we looked at them? The, the, the follow-up elections, because of that one year, I, think, I don't think they're going to be problematic. The only one that really is going to be problematic for us is ETN. You know, and every school district is different depending on how they were phased out. Correct, Mr. Gephardt? So, Board President Carrillo, uh, members of the Board, Superintendent, yes. We, we have, uh, uh, we would have to do that, that special one-time ETN election um, in February. Um, but then we don't have any uh, uh, SB9, HB33 go bond that next year. So what would end up happening is the, um, I guess it would be February of 2021, uh, election for go bond and HB 33 we push up to November of right right and, and so that would get us on the right on cycle and then we would even be able to do that in the next ETN cycle we wouldn't have to do it in February in three years or whatever the cycle okay. is we'd be able to bump that to November the year before right and so it would get us on after one special election it would get us on site so if you can present what that would look like on october 2nd that'd be great as part would of you like you. like a chart like a chronology just would whatever be? simple for us okay you know <laughs> thanks okay so um <clears throat> seven so holy smokes um we uh you know i remember when we used to have fourteen thousand kids in the district um, so it, it looks like where we're losing is the lower grades, people coming into the lower grades. Is that correct or? You know, that, that's a good question, Mr. President. And I think, you know, we, we did highlight here where we thought we were losing most of the kids, right, Christy, as we picked these schools. Um, and I, I, I think we could analyze, you know, I don't know how well we can track, you know, are they going to charters? Kids just aren't, I mean, the demographers are telling us though that those lowest grades, the babies aren't. <sighs> What is it? Birth rate. Birth rate is going down. And then also it would appear, now that I'm looking at this also, you've got Eldo, Ortiz, uh, Wood, Gormley. Those are all middles. And so in some of those schools, it could be really conceivable that, you know, this could be a, one of those cases also where we're losing kids for grade seven, eight, and they come back to us uh, in nine and in high school. So, because that's not uncommon. Anyway, I was just looking at those numbers and thinking, yeah. huh? Anybody else questions around slide? Uh, yes, I have questions, <clears throat> not questions, comments in, on slides uh, seven, eight. So seven, eight kind of go together. Yes, and nine. And nine. Is it, is, yes, the entire school district is decreasing in size, but the, not, not, of, not of my school districts. My school districts are up. All those school districts are up on the south side of town. So whenever, I just want to make it clear for the record that, yes, the entire district as a whole is decreasing somewhat, but not in the southern part, southwestern part of town. So that's something that I hope whenever we look at a lot of this funding sources that are coming from the state that we actually take that into consideration because not the entire school district is going down. My south side schools are increasing. And on that point, Mr. President, of course. that as we look at the sufficiency lawsuit, Mr. Garcia, and we look at high mm. need, ELL, poverty, um, at mobility, et cetera. One of the things that's in the order from, or the, the um, decision from Judge Singleton is that the PED is supposed to put, put into place accountability for those dollars that they really do go to the most, the, the students who are the most at risk. And those are really those schools in your district. Uh, and I'm not saying that's the only place they would go, but it's supposed to follow the children that have English language learning issues, that are in special ed, that are um, in poverty, et cetera. Anything else on seven, eight, or nine? Just really quick, it'd be interesting, and you don't have to get it to us today, is where E.J. Martinez is at, what the actual decline is there, and also uh, Tasuka. In terms of the grades? Uh, no, decline. 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 Decline.
EJ lost 35 students. And Tasuke? We'll get them for you, sir. Okay. Then moving on, um, slide 10. <clears throat> what I have is how are we going to make up for this loss of 1.4 million? Well, this is um, based on enrollment, right? That's what we're looking at in terms of the units. Now it depends how the, the units fall out. This is an estimate. And we try to um, do a best guess based on where we were last year. Is that correct, Richard? But it really depends. Um, <laughs> I mean, so even if it's 500,000, just where is it going to? Well, I mean, I think that also we're on prior year funding. So as you look at the students for the next year, um, you're going to have less, ex hopefully less expense, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Cashman? So, so my question is uh, sort of along the line of board uh, President Carrillo's, but for the current year, mm -hmm. okay, we're down 286 students. Are we going to have to pay that back to the state? Okay, no. So we're on prior year no. funding. Okay. This is okay. why we're saying we're, we, we, see, we think we will have less mm -hmm. units next year because of prior year funding. The only way that that would be offset is if you get more than 1% growth in the new year, then you actually generate those units yeah. for that yeah. year. Yeah. The other thing that we have to see, because this is just very preliminary, so right now these numbers, I wouldn't take them to the bank. I think you're going to have a much better feel after the 80th day. And the reason for that um, is, well, when is um, after the spring budget workshop will be like in March, right? More or less? Yeah, usually. They'll the adjust March. the unit yeah. value again. So depending on how enrollment falls throughout the state, the state equalization guarantee will be set a second time. This year it's, it was set a third time. Remember they did that and we saw another influx of about $800,000. So we'll have to see where all the units, where the growth was in the state, and we may actually see an increase and you won't have to make up the, the money for it. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, we don't know yet. And again, these numbers are very preliminary. We really need to see where we are at the end of the 80th. And do, do we have the 40th day counts yet? Are we at the 40th day I, mark? I don't believe so, I mean, we yet. shouldn't be no. real close. Right. We, just, we just finished the 20th. No, she asked the 40th. Yeah, so. No, we did not. So when is our 40th day? Because we must be coming yeah. close. So, you so said we just finished the 28th yeah, day? Is that so what you said? We've got another. Wow. A couple weeks to go. Okay. Two or three weeks. All right. So cool. just uh, <coughs> once you get, because that's usually the first big, the first big, big one. So yeah. once the 40th day numbers come, can you, as you've done in the past school years, bring it to us by school so we can look at and by grades. We've had that. Thank you. You want it by grade. Ruth, did you catch that? Thank you. Ms. Noble, did you have anything on this? Okay. Uh, Rudy, do you have anything on this? <coughs> what? Yes. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry. I no, that's fine. This. Uh, oh, 10. No. Okay. So then we're on to 11. So on 11, I have a couple of things. And some of this is having been at uh, the, um, the presentation in Pinasco and just hearing just such a rosy picture that I didn't, and, uh, of which I didn't believe any of it. Um, and the presentation that was given by Mr. Rounds, uh, I mean, th all these numbers he came up with were just uh, like oil well in the sky. I don't know. It's just, you know, what's interesting is the way they determine, oh, these are recurring funds, but they, they don't, <clears throat> yes, they're recurring. You're going to get money from oil and gas every year. We will in perpetuity, right? Well, I mean, until oil and gas maybe runs out. But the thing is, there's going to be something that comes. So even if it's $1 million, that's a, it's recurring income, high, low, whatever it may be. But what seems, uh, when I listen to all of this, is that <clears throat> they are super short-sighted as they don't just, re they don't remember any of the history of why we're in the situation we're in. And it's like a family that all of a sudden, uh, dad gets an amazing bonus at work, and rather than planning for the future and putting some of the money away, they just go all hog wild, you know? And even on things that may uh, need expenses every year. So, you know, that kind of came up. The, um, 
And that's my biggest concern, is I still have not heard people discussing this issue and the issue of Yazzie um, relative to, and the 1.4 billion that we may, or that we have in, ex, not excess, but additional revenue. Um, I just don't hear them talking. I hear them about, talking about spend, 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 and not how to be thrifty and make uh, long-term planning decisions. Rudy and, Rudy and then Maureen. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your concerns on the oil and gas. I mean, that's, it's volatile, so, and teacher pay is not volatile. If I give you a paycheck one year and then I say I'm going to reduce it, you know, two years from now, you're not gonna be happy. But one of the things that, you know, and I throw this out because we had a um, passionate discussion at our last board meeting on housing. And I, and I went home and I thought about th this. And what maybe we could try to do and talk with our legislatures on this, one of the things, and I use my background from the military, we all get, based on our rank and our position, we get a certain salary. So that's what our teachers get. But then we also know if you have a job and you're stationed in New York City, which we have military there, Washington, D.C., and this tiny little town way out in the place, there's a housing allowance depending upon the average cost of living. Now, I, I don't know how to figure that out, and it's a very complicated, but it would be better for us to be advocating for housing allowances because that is not a permanent thing that you're entitled to. It's only, if you get an additional housing allowance, it's only when you're in that high cost area. So let's say Santa Fe is considered a high cost for housing, but then I move to um, someplace else in the state that the housing cost, and it's based on many different factors, so it's just what's available, um, but then I move to someplace else and it gets re it gets, you're not entitled to that anymore. So, and there will be some of our very rural, so everybody thinks, oh, it's only for big cities. No, it isn't. There will be some rural, some of our maybe Indian, um, our schools on our Indian reservations that might be entitled to a housing allowance because there may be very limited housing to go there, so you have to, it costs you a lot of money. So anyways, I'm thinking that maybe um, that's something we want to talk with our legislatures about or when we're talking about in the, in the lawsuit when the, the key plaintiffs are getting together, maybe that's something that it makes it equitable whether you're teaching here in Santa Fe or Albuquerque or Hobbs, you know, whatever that, but it's given across the board and that might be a way, and I, and I know I benefited from it when I was in the military, when I went to South America where, because of security and everything, cost of living was extremely high because they said you could only live here. The minute I left, you know, that extra, and it was substantial. It went away, and, but, but my buying power was still the same whether I was stateside or whether I was in a little community. My basic salary stayed the same, it, and so they tried to come. So anyway, something for us to be thinking about when everybody's talking about all of this money, and it also helps the state because the housing allowance gets adjusted. So if we go through a downturn, they, they're going to adjust that housing allowance because we can't afford as much. So, but you know, there are experts out there that do all of this stuff and probably have experts here in uh, New Mexico that understand that concept. And it might be a way for everybody to try to retain our workforce. So Kate, and then could Rudy, was it on this particular point? Because Kate had something to this I, point. I just have really quick, 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 quick. <laughs> sure. Actually, on this point? Very, yes, very good idea. And actually, speaking with the leadership uh, the other day, a while back, is remember, this is one-time funding that we get from the oil and gas industry. Yes, there's always going to be oil there, but people may or may not realize that Permian Basin down there in the southeast corner of New Mexico and the northwest corner of Texas is the third largest basin in the world. 
that where oil and gas is coming from right now. And it's larger, that's a th other than Saudi Arabia, I forget the second, but that's the third largest basin in the world that we're receiving this one-time gas and oil revenue from, which the, the leadership feels a little worried as to how they're gonna spend this money because that's just a one-time money. And so if you're gonna start having all these programs, paying all these teachers, and then next year, the following year, or five years from now, there's no oil, Oh, we're back where we began. Well, that's where we began for there four years ago. So that's a concern that the leadership has is where we're going to go with this abundance of money. One of the things they did. So hold on a second. You realize that's not on the point that yes. Maureen was making. So, so no. So yes. So no, because the thing is, I really wanted, wanted to make a point so specifically to so this housing idea of hers. One of the great things about that is that money, one time money, can be spent on construction. On construction, meaning bricks and mortar for the state of New Mexico, whether it's state buildings, whether it's Maureen's idea project to build one time housing. No, no, I'm not building any housing. Oh. She ain't building nothing. So, 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 yeah. so I, could, I, would, I if you would, if you. So the superintendent <laughs> and her team is on it as into, we just have to be very cautious and so does the state of New Mexico as into this abundance of money that we have out there, how it's going to be spent and on what programs. Okay. In my opinion. Okay. Um, so next time when we want to be on point, if you would, if you would, so Mr. Garcia, stay on the point that we're being on and Ms. Noble. So on the previous point. Um, what about the point before? Well, there's, there's sources and uses of funds, and uh, I think Vice President Cashman is talking about potential uses of funds. I think it's a really interesting policy idea. Um, I hope, Dr. Garcia, you will mull it over because I think it's a, it's a difficult one to get done, um, but there are all of the things in place to do something like that given what HUD already does in terms of housing costs, and this is how affordable housing works. It calculates area median income based on a cost of housing and um, salaries. It's all weighed and, and exists in systems um, because, you know, there's some basic calculations that if you're paying more than 30% of your income on housing, you're considered cost burdened by that. And housing is, um, to add to Vice President Cashman's point, one of the most significant factors in poverty, um, which, you know, it is, I think, a profound um, step, and I like it because it recognizes the realities on the ground that people on an annual basis are facing in order to have the basics of, you know, the hierarchy of needs, which is shelter, in order to um, stabilize families, and all of that feeds into the public education system. So, again, I think it's a big idea. I like it a lot. I don't know how we identify levels and might think about pushing on that, but I think it's it's worth keeping in our brains. Then on that point, Ms. Cashman, if I and correct me if I'm wrong, two weeks ago or a week ago you said you didn't support something that only affected teachers. So are you saying that this would affect everybody working in the district? Yes. They all, regardless of position, because that is how many employees do you have? 1,500. Uh, but they, yes, I, I mean, every, it would be, tar but, but think about this, okay? Everybody gets their basic salary. You might. No, I get the concept yeah. totally. What I'm just saying is, yeah, last week what I heard you say is, yeah, you're I'm against not, something that's only no, for teachers. This would, this would target from low to high employees. So all of our employees, it wouldn't be just the teachers, you would be given a housing allowance if where you are employed if you live in Santa a Fe. high cost yeah. area. Okay, and, just curious. And, and, and All it right. changes. Okay. You know, because you may, you know, I mean, because they base it to. Can we include board members in this allowance, by the way? It, it no, we, on, I know no, we can't. But, I mean, but they base it on, on, so our lower enlisted folks don't receive as much as a general. I mean, that's, but, but it, and sometimes they do, you know, I mean, and it can be significant. It can be a little bit. It depends on, right. but they have this complicated formula, and I can't figure it out. I understand. I just wanted to get clear on this for everybody. Okay. Um, so anything else then on um, slide 11? Slide 11 going once, going twice, gone. Slide 12. Um, my concerns initially the same as slide 11. Uh, uh, I, equally, we passed, I said going, going, gone. We're past slide 11. We're on 12. 
I'm on 12 too. Okay. So um, this 340 is the number with, that doesn't factor in inflation. No, okay. So does. fact what? That does. That what that was to get us back to recession. No, the studies that I've read and everything that we've been reporting on uh, in the last several years says 340 was the amount in the study that was done like in 2006. Well, well this, I, number, this number is the same number that voices, because we did all the fiscal analysis okay. on the tax, and this is what it would, what you, when you adjust for inflation, this is what you would need to restore you back to a 08 recession level funding. I can pull the source and bring that to I you. I would want the source because, I mean, I think what we've been told, can, okay, so this takes us back to 08 funding. This is to restore you to, when you adjust for inflation, where we would be. All right, then I've heard numbers. This, my understanding of the number is, and I'd love to see whatever sure, uh, the, um, the source. source is, 340 is the number that I've been told now for like four years um, was what we were short, like in 2006, uh, based on the study that said this is what we should be having for public ed. That, that's two different short. numbers. That's two different numbers. And you are correct, but it's actually was actually more than that. And Which that would now would be that, something like the eight hundred million. We're talking mark. two different things. Okay. Two totally separate different things. Okay, then and, and the number's actually a little bit higher than the three forty. So the number that you're talking about, and you're correct, it's a different number. And that is what would it have taken to um, get the appropriate sufficient funding from the AIR study? That's a different number, and I can get you that number. And did they ever adjust that number for inflation? No. Do you remember when we had the recession and we had AIR funding and all of that stuff? ERA funding, not AAR, from the federal government to help get us back up. Okay, to restore us back to that level, even though we've had increases every year, we, when you adjust for inflation, we're still below 08 funding levels. So that's a different okay. number. Okay. And I could see the confusion. And then, because I remember there was one legislator who I won't name, who, who he was saying that, I mean, basically, when we start looking at all of these, uh, these elements uh, relative to ELL, uh, free reduced lunch, Native American, pre-K, early, K-3, more PD, all these things, and bringing it up and talking about teacher salaries, right, maybe the base, um, within a couple of years, not being 36 anymore, but being 40, mm -hmm. then gradually being 44, and then 48. And maybe that's where the base would be 10 years from now or whatever. He suggested that would be $1 billion. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the legislators um, who said that. So, um, and I know they're going to fall out of, they're all going to fall out of their big leather chairs, um, even though it's just keeping the seats warm. They'll, they'll fall out of their big le leather chairs as well. So my biggest concern is that yes, they are going to do what they need to do to, um, to answer uh, Judge Singleton's uh, demands in, in terms of English language learners Native, uh, Native Americans and um, uh, free and reduced lunch, but then are going to shirk any, they're going to say, this is all we got. And okay, we're, we're maintaining integrity, right, to the decision. And, you know, we're terribly sorry, but you're not going to have additional funds for pre-K, um, K3+, plus, more PD, and early childhood. But they're going to limit it to a dollar amount that answers the specific need of the lawsuit. Because the lawsuit, as I understand it, her decision, this was a, mostly about at risk, right? Well, yes and no. I think it also covers uh, our schools sufficiently funded. Because remember that they combine sufficiency with the, uh, and it just call Yazi Martinez, but it's the six plaintiffs who are funding for overall sufficiency. And if you read the decision, the, you know, the, the decision, it, it does also address teacher salaries and uh, planning time and all the things that we said we needed. But what's interesting, and a few slides back where we talk mm -hmm. about that the legislature is also looking at, you know, would they reform the tax, tax code? What are other sources of revenue? You know, um, I've, I've heard all kinds of things, right? So, and so, and so all yeah, those new sure. sources of revenue, they're going to have to look at it because the way the decision is written, you can't say we don't have enough money. That's what's been said for X amount of years. And the judge is saying, that ain't going to cut it. You're going to have to figure out, 
Are you going to raise taxes? Are you going to identify new sources of revenue to, to generate? But, but to say we don't have the money to do this is no longer going to be um, acceptable. I understand that, but in terms of what money they say they now have, like let's say they come up with some figure of $700 million. They can say how they're going to allocate that, True. and it may not be our agenda. Right. Uh, it's very gray. Uh, Mr. Garcia. Uh, Mr. President, I would just like to move on. We, we have this lawsuit that has been settled, and we're actually it's going to move forward. It's still under an appeal. could be possibly under an appeal, and we, we, can't, we can't control what the legislature is going to do or how PED is going to analyze it and move it forward. We can sit here all night long and talk about how it should work, what it should say, why it should go to this person. So I would just like to move on. I would disagree with you, Mr. Garcia, because I would say there are almost 500 board members throughout this state. And if they were to learn how to agree on something and then learn how to organize in their districts and in their precincts the way they ran the very first time, not many of them are 12 plus years, right? Then you would have all of these parents in all of these precincts lobbying the legislature. Now, it doesn't need to be a nonprofit. There's, it's a nonprofit called the state of New Mexico. It's like this is how, this is how politics works. Um, they, as they, as people that are elected officials, go back to their constituents or their constituents go to them. Anyway, anybody else have anything for, yes, Ms. Uh, Cashman on slide 12. Uh, yeah. um, so w when we were talking about um, this and things that might be funded, one of the things was pre-K. And I understand the value of pre-K, but I think it bears in mind that when we talk about the sufficiency lawsuit, it was for K through 12. So I, I mean, I think just since you sit on that committee, Superintendent, I would, I would caution us that there's not going to be enough money just for K through 12, and then if we have to fund pre-K out of that, um, so that, that's a separate, I mean, I, I agree, we need pre-K, but that's not what the sufficiency lawsuit was about. It was for K through 12 education. It would be like saying, we are gonna fund higher education, which they have needs out of our K through 12, and we would say, absolutely not, so. But she did identify it in her decision. So Anything just, else on uh, page 12? Page 13. Um, I don't have anything on there. Uh, Ms. Noble and then Ms. Cashman. Dr. Garcia, I'm hoping, and I, I think what I heard from Richard was that, and I'm hoping you'll just explain the teacher cost index a little more, or, or maybe Mr. Helford can, but what I heard was I think a four-year um, gradual shift from the T&E index to a teacher cost index by chunks of 25 percent a year so that it's it's changing um, what is the basis of the teacher cost index and even just a brief um, summary of the policy thinking behind that well, I think to understand the the inadequacies of the current one I could point out a, an example of two teachers, uh, one teacher A having an MA with 20 years of experience, the other one having the same level of experience, same degree, one's a tier two, one's a tier three. They both generate the same value on the, t the current TNE index, but we're spending, it, it's costing us eight, 9,000 more in salaries because they happen to, one happens to be on tier three, the other one's still on tier two. So they recognize that and instead of the years of experience, they said that they're going to weigh that tier level, um, well, for the first time really, not even more, they're gonna. According to who's actually on salary and, and what we're what actually What their paying. license level is. Okay. So which, which, which translates into the higher salary. It's really mm -hmm. what level degree of license they've achieved from PD. And this begins in the current fiscal year or the next one? I, I think in 2020 is where I first saw the, the, the first implementation will take place. And, and I actually got um, a presentation. This is what they provided at the vast ASBO training. Uh, it's about 20 pages or so. Um, I'm, I'm sure they won't mind sharing it. Um, they shared it with us. And, and it, it has a lot of, of, of detail in here kind of going back to looking at what it was before, what it will be in the future. Mm -hmm. um, the hold harmless part is really the, the part that's kind of 
where it really gets uh, into the weeds. <laughs> mm -hmm. um. And so it strikes me that that is a good thing for um, a better alignment of funding um, and what the PED is doing. So it, it looks like, sounds like good policy. Um, and it will, if we fast forward a couple of years, I would imagine actually because there will be higher compensation to districts for teachers at higher tiers, um, the competition heats up for teaching staff markedly over the next few years. And so, um, Dr. Garcia, I don't know if you want to add anything, but it sounds to me like the moves being made in HR become more and more important very quickly. Absolutely. No, I, I agree. That's all I could say. Uh, Ms. Cashman? I'm still confused on this teacher cost index. So, so, and, and I'd like to understand, and if mm -hmm. it's too long, you can send me something. Mm -hmm. but, but you said if somebody is a tier two and they have a master's degree and 20 years experience, and we have a tier three that has a master's degree and 20 years experience, yes. they go under this new teacher cost index are going to be equivalent because- Under the old one. Under the old one, they were generating the exact same factor. Well, they shouldn't have been because tier three. It's the problem. Okay, so because tier three requires a lot. I mean, you have professionally developed more, mm -hmm. you know, and so. But, so okay, okay. So, let, so let's go back. The T&E index what, uh, gave you credit for training and experience. It did not address the tiers. So it's just so many hours of credit and, and, and your degrees. And remember, right? So many, so many years of experience and degrees or hours. So you get like MA plus 15 or a bachelor's plus 15 or whatnot. Our licensure system, level one, level two, level three, is not addressed in T&E. So there was a misalignment. So what he was saying, level two and level three teachers were generating the same index. This is better aligned to the three-tier system. The funding reality. And it actually does have some examples of what it was previously and what it will be before. So you could kind of um, see those. Additional questions on the TD? Um, <clears throat> we already did capital outlay, so we're not going to do that. Is that all right? So. Uh -huh. So the last slide is questions, not the question. <laughs> More questions. Okay. okay. Not on since any of the slides or on capital outlay? No, since this is a finance. All right, um, it's fine. <laughs> you know, so um, can, can you tell us, Superintendent, just approximately how much money we have in our um, reserves? our cash, you know, a cash reserve. And we just had that audited, or we're just, I mean, you just had to submit that to PED, correct? Uh, yeah, we, we did do the final cash report, which gave us what we ended the year with, which okay. um, we were pleasantly surprised with. But what we had budgeted um, in in May, we put aside approximately five and a half million, um, most of it being in the emergency reserve line item, the most restrictive and safest place, I suppose. Uh, but then the rest of it, we, we, we put throughout uh, the functions. Um, we prorated it throughout the functions. Most of it, of course, then being in direct instruction. What was the amount? Yeah, I believe it was somewhere around five and a half million. Okay, okay. Th thank you. And I'm just, I'm just throwing this out. Um, I, I, I apologize for missing a meeting back in August. Um, on um, where we were talking about funding um, communities in school or initiative that they wanted. Um, I would like to maybe bring that item back up to the board and talk about maybe taking, um, I did happen to meet with communities in school um, and for various reasons, they are short 100,000. Um, and they, um, the program is costing them more to run. Um, the national model says a school district should be contributing about 30%. We actually contribute about 17% right now. Um, so I would like us to maybe consider out of cash reserves at a future board meeting to at least fund them for 
um, 100,000 for my cash reserves. And the reason I say that, um, and I know we have a lot of other very valuable programs out there, but this seems to me like, and I know other board members have met individually with communities in school, but this seems to me one of the things that the whole sufficiency lawsuit is about. If our staff is not spending time uh, figuring out, do you need food? Do you need shelter for the next night? If an individual teacher is not figuring out all of that, they're able to, um, you know, concentrate on the core mission of education. I know that the request was for uh, 250,000, and I would be amenable to that out of cash reserve to add another program so all of our feeder schools into Capitol High would have communities in school, but we might not be able to get there. But um, the community has been very generous to communities in school. They value it. They value Santa Fe Public Schools. And so this might be something um, for us to think. And I brought it up here in the finance because obviously we need to know how much mm -hmm. money we have. And so I would like to just, I'm not asking we can't make a decision or anything, but I would like board members to think about it and maybe to bring this in the near future and um, maybe think, uh, you know, we, we want to try to maintain for our bond rating about uh, 5 million, correct? Uh, you know, or five, well, we usually say we want about uh, $5 million um, for our bond rating. And so, I, you know, we've got a little bit of wiggle room and it could be a one-time a one-time funding and then maybe the next time when we talk about their student funding and everything I have a, another great idea for how we can get maybe up to that 30 percent for communities and school so I just throw that out I know that wasn't on the agenda but because it was a finance meeting I'm just throwing that out to board members no it's there it's there because it's a uh, one it's a finance meeting into its impacts of operational budget and you know they're part of our operational budget so I would uh, I would agree with you I would say let's bring it back on October 7th or 19th I would say let's bring it back for the full 250 so that we can bring Nina Otero online and because I know that was a really big piece for them and Nina Otero uh, would benefit uh, greatly as well as other schools and also Santa Fe High so um, I mean, I think their original ask was completely reasonable, and then integrate that into the overall budget and planning for the next fiscal year. Or, or we could, you know, just have a couple of different options so board members might and from cash. out from out of the cash <laughs> reserves, whether it's a hundred thousand or two hundred and fifty. But I, I just bring well, that up, and um, I would like to, since other board members have met with communities and school. Um, that maybe we could get there and maybe we still can't but I don't think we need another okay. presentation we don't need a presentation I'd like to put it on the October 2nd agenda um, and I'd like it as you said to be specifically from cash because I remember that the last discussion that failed like six weeks ago or whatever it was when you were taking the girls to college um, one of the biggest concerns was and Ms. Noble you brought this up the how, how many hours we spent on that other list right so now to move something around um, at the last minute on that list uh, was not a prudent decision. So if it came from cash, that list stays intact as, as we appropriate those funds. So October 2nd. And then what I would encourage us to do in that time, and maybe you can get this from uh, Ms. Bergen, is um, the 250, how that would be allocated. And if that could come to us um, by Thursday of next week, so that we have ample time to review it. That can just come in our email. Ms. Noble. I appreciate that. I appreciate the approach. Um, I, and for the record, I'm willing to revisit the list, but I, I wasn't willing to chunk out, um, you know, out of any one item, item, particularly that line item, if we want to. And Vice President Cashman has said she, she doesn't want to revisit the list. And I do feel we spent a lot of time on that, and it's pretty good. You know, we, I, I, I do think we could fine tune it, but I'm okay not as well. Um, and I would just reiterate what you said, President Carrillo, and, and I said this when I met with communities and schools, you know, I think it's a great program, but I think it is our, um, 
job to understand what the money's going for, how we measure success, and ask questions about what happens in the next year if it's one-time money. Um, and I know they've been thinking a lot about those questions. So um, if we are, um, I, I mean, I would say we can, we can set a date, we can ask for it by then, I'm perfectly happy to, and if they need another couple weeks, I'm perfectly happy with that as well. Yeah, so sh we'll shoot for the second. If Julia says, um, <clears throat> can you give us to the, whatever, the 16th, that's fine. And I think they know where they want to allocate it. And so if you could make sure that they know, we do not want a presentation, but if one, if one of them, whether it's Julia or staff, could just be here to stand for questions, That'd be great. Is that acceptable to the board? I would suggest some printed information would be helpful too. Well, we're going to get that. It, yeah. Yeah, by Thursday. Great. Great. Okay, so anything else on uh, before we move to 4B? Hearing none, we're moving to 4B, which is enrollment, including shift of employees um, to operational. Actually, I think this was all part of the presentation. Okay, in that, in that case, We've okay, so in that case, I'm, the things I'm curious about and what prompted my curiosity, and even the, our speaking uh, the other night in Pinasco, is I know the two things that I can think of are the person, I think you said her name was Deborah or Debbie or somebody from PED. Oh, Debbie Rail. Yeah, okay, so we have that position of strategic, it's the um, chief academic strategist. Okay, chief academic strategist. So there was that person, and because I noticed you mentioned that the other night before we were in Penasco, and I mean, it dawned on me later in the evening that I was long home. And then I noticed Mr. Lewandowski, and I don't, rem is he an assistant security? So that was, um, if you recall, that was a position that went vacant. Lewandowski's position, uh, that was um, Maria Lisa Dilda. When's the last time we had Maria Lisa Dilda? She left in the spring. What'd she do? What did she do? Well, she, I don't, I she, don't, uh, she assisted, you know she assisted Gabriel Merrill. Well, we had a, at the last, we had a, who was? You're, so you're trying to get at like the FTEs and so what I can. It was the me. meeting we had, so there's. Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, how are these positions being funded? So if Maria's, if that we had was, been... That was an existing position, okay. and then I think you we added mm -hmm. in that budget, I think it was a point two FTE to make it a full-time person. New admin position, okay. Okay. So, so the, that's why I'm bringing this up. Right. And then and on, then, the, on um, the chief, chief academic, academic strategist, strategist if you recall that you restored that 100000 that we had, and then I had 30000 left over from um, Dr. Ryan is not a full-time employee. However, now that Ms. Wilson-Segura has resigned, we are looking at reassigning, and we're not going to hire her replacement right away. We want to see how, this is, how our new model is working, and can we use those dollars in a different way. So... But, so then my but you had restored back. We had cut a hundred over a hundred thousand in admin. But was it for? The, the, I guess what I it would seem that amongst the cabinet, we should already have within their skill set a chief academic strategist. Yeah. Hold on a second. We should already have that, and there shouldn't be the need for this new position you know, from this person coming from the public education department. And so even though there was the 100,000 restored to admin, I don't know that the board would know, and this is, you know, this, let's face it, this is under your purview, right? And, um, but that's just, that's the concern. I, I don't, my own concern is there should, whatever, her, I mean, I don't know what you've written for her job description or anything, but um, just that, as the name implies, I'm thinking to myself, why don't, why isn't somebody who's currently on the cabinet performing these functions, why does it need the additional hundred grand? On the, um, also saying that Ms. Segura resigned, I don't know that we knew she was going to resign or not, but this 
was done before her resignation, yes. which would lead me yes. to think that, yes, there might be additional funds by not refilling her position, but we didn't know that. No. So, I, wait, wait, wait. I, so Mr. President, with all due respect, I think this is actually getting into having the superintendent, getting, getting in, the, in the powers of the superintendent and running her school district. And I, I think we should leave it up to her to determine and decide where the positions come from, what the funding is about. And we should stick to policy for the entire school district. But you know what one of the other things is besides, I think neither of you got it correct when you're interviewed for uh, the board. There are three things. There's policy, there's hiring the superintendent, there's managing the budget and approving the budget. This is a lot of money, this is the budget. And so that's why I bring this up. The reason I also bring this up is that we are under fire, and I don't think correctly so, but do, we are under fire in particular for having being admin heavy. I know that Think New Mexico is full frontal assault with the legislature on their, the initiative that didn't go last year, they're putting forward this year. So my concern is if we're bringing on more admin, how does this look relative to what's going on right now in the legislature and how people so are, are answering I, and that? And I can answer that. Of course, please. Okay. If the board would like I just, to. I, I want to weigh in because I am uncomfortable with going down this road. I don't know. You started out by saying we said something in Penasco. You apparently have knowledge that um, was not in this presentation, or, nor am I seeing or understanding the road we're going down. And I do think it's veering to running the district if we are starting to talk about whether we're funding particular positions or not and what the job description is. So. You know, I, I'm not clear where we've gone all of a sudden, and um, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with this. Okay, then I would have to say with all due respect, I know when we were going through the budget process, we were asking for line items on how different positions were funded, what positions were funded, where and what functions were. I mean, because that, that is our function. I mean, I know that when uh, Mr. Grimmer was with us, they would, he would print out you know, and, and I don't think, you know, I can answer, but please but, answer. But, yeah. but, but, but let's be clear that when, when, when Mr. Grundler was here and I built the budget with him. Yeah, of course. We look at certain amount of FTE. Within that, it's within my administrative authority to stay within budget and readjust and move and, and shift and find, okay, can I fund part of this out of federal program? Can I move some money from here? Oh, I've got a 0.6 FTE. I'm going to save this money. The board, and you in particular, actually, said, you know, we really had to focus on making some accelerated improvement in our schools. Accelerated improvement. Ms. Sink has expertise. And she, is wor she has worked very hard to be able to align curriculum, to prov you know, provide professional development, provide ensuring that we have the, the right PD. Um, if you only knew all the requirements that come from the PED that we have to manage, I mean, there's a lot. With that said, we also implemented Team Santa Fe to provide more support to the schools. What became evident is that I, I still had that FTE that was in that, that you all restored. We also have to look at timing and where are people. And we knew that there are people leaving, uh, you know, throughout the state that are looking for positions and that we needed, we had some, a, a, a need. And that is, is there somebody out there who can do turnaround? And, uh, and to help us move a little bit quicker that has experience with turnaround. So we advertised, we had a few applicants. I was pleased that Ms. Rael was the top applicant. And I believe she's, she does have specific experience in turning around districts and turning around schools. And so she is going to be an added person. Now, if she had, if, if we had not lost Ms. Segura, and we still had that um, same compliment, I would have used her talents in a different way. Now that she's gone, I have decided, let's, instead of bringing yet another new person and another new dynamic, let's see if we can use her skills within what we have, and can I use those dollars in a different way, maybe for contract services. If we do wind up moving it, then I would bring a budget adjustment request. But I am living within my FTEs, and actually I did provide, even though we changed titles, the, the FTE actually right now is exactly the same for that level of people. 
what I do want to say is that Mr. Nathan did a records request on our positions and I was able to show him, every, I, we created documents for him, which we didn't have to do under IPRA, but I did in the spirit of good faith and transparency. And actually he and I were on a board, uh, on a panel together, and he said Santa Fe Public Schools has really done a good job with that. I agree, we do have to pay attention to that. And, and I do try to keep tabs of that. I also want to make sure that I'm staffing in a way that can give us the most leverage to see the most school improvement. And I appreciate the board and their recognizing that within those FTEs, I, I will change. I do change titles. I do move things around. We have to be nimble to be able to meet the need as I see it at a particular point in time or with the particular staff I have because different people have different skills. And I continue it. If you look, I have, I have readjusted over the last three years to meet different needs where we are in the organization at a particular point in time. Um, Ms. Cashman. Going on to a different issue because I might have been sleeping. I don't think I was. We didn't discuss it. Fair student funding? Yeah. Fair yeah, student. we haven't discussed it. You know, oh, okay. For some reason, that was an oversight, and I think it's something we do want to bring back. Um, yeah. And now, I have to tell you, I have mixed feelings about it because of if we actually get funding to be able to better meet the needs of at-risk youth, where the fair student funding formula has, I think, cut us short or has failed us is that it didn't recognize schools like El Dorado, Asequia, small schools, Tezuke, that don't have economies of scale. So you have to supplement them. And to have a supplemental pool year after year seems somewhat ridiculous because the funding isn't sufficient because of economies of scale. Therefore, the funding formula did not work for them. So I think it's something we need to revisit, but I think we also need to revisit in terms of what the legislature actually does this next year. And, and, and so I'm, I'm glad we're going to, because I told you I had another brilliant idea on fair student funding. Um, when I did meet with communities in school, and, and I thought, how can we get to this 30%? And the money is coming out of the overall district budget. Shouldn't those schools be paying for their portion of that program? I mean, we're funding the kids at a different level. I don't know, but that might help us get quicker to the 30 percent to meet the national goal. So I just throw that out. There are many different things that even though fair students says, you know, you should get enough to operate your schools, but if we think that communities and school is an integral partner, then shouldn't that be part of their, you know, they're funding it out of their portion instead of because we're doing that with uh, uh, different other programs. So I'm just throwing that out, but I would like to visit their student funding because it seems to me there are core functions, it doesn't matter the size of the school, that we want to see in our schools. I want to see a secretary in every school. They need a secretary. I want to see a principal in every school. They need, it doesn't matter whether you have 100 kids or you have, you know, 2,000 but there are some core things that now, whether you need more because you get a bigger enrollment, we gotta talk, but I wanna see a counselor, at least one in every school, you know, whatever those things are, but until we discuss that, you know, we can go buzz, budget based. Um, zero based budget? Yeah, zero based budget. I mean, there are many different approaches, but I just seem to have felt that fair student, I love the concept, but the, Reality. The implementation speak. just didn't match what we had hoped, I think. So let's talk about it again. I, so then we should put that. So why was that here tonight? You know, to be honest with you, I think that that was the intent to, to include it in this presentation. Oh, okay. And, That's fine. And it was left out. So then what we'll do, um, so, yes. Um, and the next finance is in December, right? Yes, sir. Is that okay to wait to December to discuss that? Because that would, that's the beginning of the budget process. So, okay, so we'll make sure that there's, it's there in December. 
And for me personally, while I understand it has some challenges, I think conceptually it's not worthy of our getting rid of it. I think it's worthy of our um, uh, somehow that the, uh, for a couple of years we held those schools that you named, harmless, uh, but working in something uh, because I think conceptually it's brilliant. And um, so I'd like us to build on it so that it works for everybody. But anyway, December. Um, great. So, uh, capital outlay we already did. Just, just really quick, and yeah. the, on the, you guys have excellent ideas on how to run the school district. So if you can actually get your ideas to the superintendent so that we don't have to discuss it at the December meeting, that way you guys, we all be prepared and, and go over what the recommendations are and how it would, would work if your idea, your idea. But that's the point of a study session. We're going to discuss it. At, we're going to discuss it. At the study session. That's why we have the okay, study we'll session. Discuss at the study session who has the best and the greatest ideas. Instead of getting your ideas to the superintendent and bringing them forward for all of us to decide, say, great, let's move forward. We'll, we'll discuss all the great ideas at the December meeting. That's fine. Okay. Actually, I'm not sure what. Okay, that's fine. Great. Um, anything else for board discussion or possible action? Moving on. Just really quick, um, if it, if I saw APS actually is meeting with their emergency communication center, the 911 center, to see if they can uh, correlate their cameras with the E911 center. If we could actually have our staff meet with Ken Martinez from our emergency 911 center, so he can actually see how and if and how much it would cost to see if the cameras, if there's an incident, at what whatever school, hopefully there whatever is, those cameras at the E911 center can actually be turned on and we can see what's happening at the schools just if they can meet and see what it would cost. Thank you. So that's pretty cool. So wait a minute, what you're saying is at the flick of a switch, yes. an APS, I don't know if they have it or examining it based on what you said, they can, boom, get all the shots from a camera to school that may be under siege. Yes. So really quick, I went to, uh, wow. here, here, this is where we're going these days. And this, it's not just technology, it's actually camera and phones. You, you actually, when you take a picture of somebody, something, the camera's not just looking at Miss Sink there. It's actually looking at everything, the background, the color, the lights, everything else, and it's a different parts of frames that the cameras are now picking up. They actually have this device you can put in parks and schools. It'll, it'll actually, if there's a shot in that school, a 22 and higher caliber, not a firework, everything else, that, that microphone will pick it up, send it to 911 center, and those cameras will start rolling on that school so or we, any shopping center. So social. we did talk about that, and I know Mr. Romero had looked into it, and I know that they, they piloted it in certain parts of the city, and now I guess APS is doing it. But I thought that what it did was dispatch, right? But you had asked about that too. Remember that there was a company, and uh, there were two, there was Eagle, uh, it was Eagle and like if Mr. Gephardt, do you remember the other company? It was, it was Eagle and some other company that, that we met with, um, mm -hmm. right? Eagle was one of them. And I know that at that time, Mr. Romero was the um, director of safety and security. And I know he did have a couple of concerns, but I think we can certainly look at it. The part that I'm trying to figure out is I thought you said they interface our ca the, like our camera system with the city, with the police department. With the emergency 911 center, which is both city and county board that oversees so it. So that part, I don't think we have explored. So, um, Ruth, did you capture that? Thank you. Okay. Any else for board discussion? Any concerns or requests? And thank you, by the way, very much, everyone, for uh, moving this to 6 o'clock. I had a mandatory thing. There was no possible way I could come at 5. Um, so thank you. And may I thank also Mr. Halford and his team. I think for the presentation. They did a really yeah. good job today. And Mr. Robert, and um, you Mr. have to call him. No, no uh, I was going to make a joke about the fact that he knew you since you were four. There you go. Oh, that's fine. So you, you could share those with us, and we can pull them out when we need to. But uh, thank you, Richard, you and your team for putting all of this together. So anything else for advanced planning? Any concerns or dates? All right, we're adjourned. Thank you. Ms. Cashman, can you go over the MOU? Well, that's fine. I have to stay. It won't be too long. Okay. Yeah. I have to eat.